what that means in some sense is what we know is established on a form of knowledge that we don't really understand and that if those two things are out of sync, so you might say if our articulated knowledge is out of sync with our dream, then we become dissociated internally. We think things we don't act out and we act out things we don't dream and that produces a kind of sickness of the spirit and, and that sickness of the spirit, it, it, see, it, its cure is something like an integrated system of belief and representation. And then people turn to things like ideologies, which I regard as parasites on an underlying religious substructure to try to organize their thinking, and then that's a catastrophe. And that's what Nietzsche, Nietzsche foresaw, you see. He knew that when we knock the slats out of the base of Western civilization by destroying this representation, this, this God ideal, let's say, that we would destabilize and move back and forth violently between nihilism, let's say, and the extremes of ideology. He was particularly concerned about radical left ideology, you know, and believed and, and, and predicted this in the late 1800s, which is really an absolute intellectual tour de force of staggering magnitude, predicted that in the 20th century that hundreds of millions of people would die because of the replacement of these underlying dreamlike structures with this rational, rational but deeply incorrect representation of the world. And, you know, we've been oscillating back and forth between left and right in some sense ever since. And, you know, with some good sprinkling of nihilism in there and despair. And in some sense, that's the situation of the modern Western person and in, in increasingly of people in general. You know, I think part of the reason that Islam has its backup with regards to the West to such a degree, I mean, there's many reasons and not all of them are valid, that's for sure. But one of the reasons is that, you know, they, they being still grounded in a, in, a, in a dream, let's say, they can see that the rootless questioning mind of the West po poses a tremendous danger to the integrity of their culture. Now, and it does. I mean, Westerners, us, we undermine ourselves all the time with our searching intellect. And I'm not complaining about that, it, you know. I mean, it, it, there isn't anything easy that can be done about it. But, but it's still, it's still a, a sort of well, fruitful catastrophe. And, you know, it, it has real effects on people's lives. It's not some abstract thing, you know. I mean, lots of times when, when I've been treating people for depression, for example, or anxiety, they have existential issues, you know. It's not just some psychiatric condition. It's, it's not just that they're capped off of normal because their brain chemistry is faulty, although, you know, sometimes that happens to be the case. It's that they are overwhelmed by the suffering and complexity of their life, and they're not sure why it's reasonable to continue with it. You know, they, they, they can feel the terrible negative meanings of life, but are skeptical beyond belief about any of the positive meanings. I had one client who was a very brilliant artist, and as long as he didn't think, he was fine, you know, because he'd go and create, and he was really good at being an artist. He just, you know, he had that personality that was com continually creative and quite brilliant, although he was self-denigrating. But as soon as he started to think about what he was doing, then, you know, the, the what was it? it's like a, like a drill or a thaw or something like that. He'd saw the branch off that he was sitting on because he'd start to criticize what he was doing, even the utility of it, even though it was sort of self-evidently useful. And then he would be, then it would be very, very hard for him to even motivate himself to create. And he, I, he always struck me as a good example of, of the consequences of having your rational intellect divorced in some way from your being divorced enough so that it actually questions the utility of your being. And it's not a good thing. It's, it's not a good thing. And it's, it, it's really not a good thing because it manifests itself not only in individual psychopathology, but also in social psychopathology. And that's this proclivity of people to get tangled up in ideologies, which, which I really do think of as, as they're, like, they're like crippled religions. That's the right way to think about them. They're like a religion that's missing an arm and a leg but can still hobble along and it, it provides a certain amount of security and group identity but it's, it's warped and twisted and demented and bent and it's a parasite on something underlying that's rich and true and that's how it looks to me anyways. And, and so, so I think it's very important that we sort out this problem. Um, I, think that, I think that there isn't anything more important that needs to be done than that. I've, I've thought that for a long, long time, uh, probably since 
the early 80s, uh, when I started looking at the, psych the role that belief systems played in regulating psychological and social health. Um, because they, you can tell that they do that because of how upset people get if you challenge their belief systems. It's like, why the hell do they care exactly? What difference does it make if, if all of your ideological axioms are 100% correct? Like, people get unbelievably upset when you, when you poke them in the axioms, so to speak. And <laughs> it, isn't, it is not by any stretch of the imagination obvious why, you know? But there's some, it's like there's a fundamental truth that they're standing on. It's, it's, it's like they're on a raft in the middle of the ocean and you're starting to pull out the logs, you know, and they're afraid they're going to fall in and drown. It's like drown in what? And what are the logs protecting themselves, protecting them from? And why are they so afraid to, to move beyond the confines of the ideological system? And these are not obvious things. So I've been trying to puzzle that out for a very long time. And I've, I've done some lectures about that that are on YouTube, most of you know that. And some of what I'm going to talk about in this series, you'll have heard if, if you've listened to the YouTube videos.